Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Humor Book Launch series. Uh, my name is Azza Mustafa. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Huma, the Institute for Humanities in Africa at the University of Cape Town. And today we have a book entitled Our Goats, uh, Where Once People's uh, Stories on Death and Dying. Um, we have today with us um, the editor of the book, um, which the book is actually a collection of creative work and uh, nonfiction work on uh, the unique experiences of grief. And we are all looking forward to, to listen to the talk. Um, so today we have the editor of the book, uh, Bongani Kona, who is a PhD candidate and a lecturer in the Department of History at the University of Western Cape. His work has appeared in various places, including Jimoringa, uh, Safe House Explorations in Creative Nonfiction, The Daily Assortment of, of Astonishing Things and Other Stories, The Buffler, and the BBC Radio 4. He was awarded the Ruth Fer uh, Ferris Fellowship in 2019. And he's also shortlisted for the Kane Prize for African Writing in 2016. Um, welcome with us, uh, Rongani. And um, we have also our second guest today is Catherine Bull, who is an audio maker, a writer and a researcher based at the Institute for Creative Arts, University of Cape Town, where she researches live art in South Africa and produces the ICA podcast. With the director of the ICA, uh, Jay Pather, she co-edited the collection uh, Acts of Transgression, Contemporary Life Art in South Africa, published by Wits University. Uh, and the book is uh, shortlisted for the National Institute for the Humanities and the Social Science Nonfiction Book Award in 2020. Um, welcome again, our guests. And without further ado, I will give the floor to Bongani to give us a, a 20 to 25 minutes uh, this um, reflection on the book. And then we will have the discussion um, for 10 to 15 minutes with Catherine. And then we will open the floor for the audience. Thank you very much and welcome. Okay. Um... Yeah, thank you so much as a good afternoon, everyone. And um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And also just a special thanks to Aza, Minetle and Divine and Amina and everyone who's made uh, this event today possible. Uh, I need to start with uh, an apology, two apologies. One is that um, my laptop is giving me problems. So I'm on my phone. So if there are any interruptions, please forgive me. The second is that um, my understanding was that I was just going to speak briefly about the book for about 10 minutes and then go into a conversation with Catherine. So, yeah, just apologies for that. Um, it's okay. fine. No worries. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I was like, oh, my goodness. When I heard 20 minutes. Uh, so, yeah, I just uh, I've sketched out a few notes. So I'm going to speak briefly about the anthology I goes for one's people, uh, stories of death and dying. And as a way to begin. I'd like to read the first two paragraphs from the introduction and then speak briefly about how the collection came about. And then I think more importantly, the form that it takes. Uh, so here goes, um, this is from the introduction. When we got the news that my cousin Yvonne's cancer had come back a second time, it didn't cross my mind that she would die. She was only 40 years old, but the cancer had spread all over and her condition deteriorated rapidly. She died in the nighttime, holding her mother's hand. This was weeks after the country had been placed on lockdown alert level five. And because we couldn't travel, my mother and I watched the funeral on Zoom. This, as the saying goes, is how we live now. This has been a time of unremitting grief. People have lost loved ones, homes, jobs, and suffered all kinds of setbacks, large and small. At a time like this, the consolation literature holds out, holds out to us is that we're never alone. During a phone conversation in the early days of South Africa's lockdown with the writer and audio maker, Catherine Ball, 
one of the contributors to this book, we discovered that we'd each been turning to Svetlana Alexevich's Chernobyl Prayer, a chronicle of the future, an oral history of the nuclear disaster in the Soviet Union in 1986, to make sense of the times. As we stared out onto the wide, empty streets from our respective homes, Alexevich's words resounded in our ears like a prophecy. We've, we now find ourselves on a new page of history. The history of disasters has begun. I'll stop there. I think the main point was also just to say that I'm profoundly grateful to be in conversation with, uh, with Catherine Bull, because uh, we have been in conversation for a few years now, now, both as friends and as colleagues and as collaborators. So yeah, thank you so much for agreeing to be part of this, uh, Catherine. And so the project uh, goes so once people, it's always very difficult to talk about uh, books as if they have like one defining beginning point. And for me, the, what I will say is that the book started taking shape in late 2019. And I think it has its origins in this, um, maybe what I'll call the grim repetition of violence and loss, particularly in our public life. And I'll give you an example of this. So in April this year, a man was burned to death in Dipsloot in Johannesburg. And those of us who have been following that story, it's impossible not to have your mind flash back to that photograph from 2008 of yet another man on his hands and knees, his flesh burning, begging for his life. In 2019, a university student goes to the post office and is never heard from again. In 2013, the body of a 17-year-old is found disemboweled at a construction site in Freda's Drop in the Western Cape. I don't even have to mention the names. Most of you will know who I'm talking about. Some of you will even remember where you were when you heard the news. So I guess the book, in a way, attempted to respond to this kind of accumulation of loss or yeah, this kind of accumulation of loss in our public life. So that's where we began in sort of 2019. And then the pandemic came to our shores in 2020. And so I just want to move on from there just to talk about the form that the book itself takes. Um, I myself um, have always been inspired. I've been inspired by literary journals. I've worked in literary journals. And one of the things I love about literary journals, and let me actually take a step back, my favorite one of my favorite literary journals is by Chimurenga, Chimurenga issue 11, called uh, Conversations with Poets Who Refuse to Speak. It's a book, it's a journal that attempts to look at silence as a form of protest. And I love how it works together, how the pieces both speak to each other and sometimes contest each other. And so that's, that's the, that was the starting point in, in to say that, could this, what was, what I was actually trying to do, what I was hoping that we would do is that we would produce a literary journal um, that gets sold as a book, but primarily what we're trying to do was to work on a literary journal. And what, one of the things that the really good literary journal allow us to do is that they utilize all forms of writing. They utilize poetry, as, as I had already begun saying in the, in the introduction, to make use of poetry, to make use of fiction, to make use of creative nonfiction essays. Uh, and in our ghosts or ones people also includes photography. And so this is the way that we might um, look at an issue prismatically. So to take one point, to take one subject and look at it in as many different forms as possible. And one of the editors who uh, has been like an inspiration to me was also, uh, his name is John Freeman, he used to be the editor of Granta a few years back, maybe five, six years back, uh, when Ella Wakatama Alfie was also the deputy at Granta. Uh, he's since started his own literary publication called Freeman's. And I love this publication and quietly also one of the inspirations for our Ghost So Once people. And something that he said really struck me, he says that, you know, uh, form holds us in different ways. Sometimes it's a close embrace, other times it's like a chaperone straw. We need those varying degrees of intimacy and engagement to look at the world prismatically. And um, that's one of the things is that I've also contributed a lot to, to books that are published in this country and elsewhere. And one of the things about collections, which I sometimes struggle with, is that 
there's always a prescription on length. There's a prescription that each piece has to come in at say 3,000 uh, words in length or 4,000 words in length or 5,000 words in length. And I find that as a reader, I need surprise, you know, I need, I need, I need some certain kind of surprise. So I like what happens when you put an essay and you put a poem and you put photographs one after the other, like the kind of conversation that opens up. Um, so this is also something that, like I said, we're trying to do with the, with the book. And just to come back now, just to the subject before I hand over to Catherine, um, one of the things that the book does as well, or what it allows us to do is to look at death, not only from um, in different scales as well, different scales and different registers. So I'll give you two examples. So um, uh, when I started talking to the writers in 2019, one of the first writers I approached is Mary Watson, uh, who won the Kane Prize for African Writing in the mid 2000s. And we also used to teach uh, at UCT around about that time. And she's, um, she had published, she's, after winning the Kane Prize, she published a collection of short stories called Moss with Quella. And then a second book was called The Cutting Room, uh, which is a crime novel set in Cape Town. And I remember at the time, I used to review books quite a lot for the Cape Times. And I remember at the time that she had said she wrote the book in five weeks because she was grieving for her mother who had, uh, she had watched the mother die from cancer at a hospice. And she worked on this project and it was propelled by grief. So when, when I reached out to Mary Watson, I said to her, please, uh, could you just take us as readers into that moment? Just take us into that moment in an essay, just talk to us about that time. And then the pandemic hit, this was in late 2019, when the pandemic came, um, I think a lot of people, I'm not alone in this, that a lot of us struggled to read and to write. And so we I pushed, the deadlines got pushed back. And in that moment, um, Mary just wrote back to say that she's having a personal crisis and uh, she needs the extra time, it's come at a good time. Um, Mary Watson's piece would end up becoming the opening essay of the collection. And what happened is that she lives in Ireland now and at that time nobody could travel. And at that time, my father also, she lost her father to cancer. And this was something she could only see through, through a screen and she writes about that, that experience. And, I think that was like kind of really profoundly moving, but I also just wanting to talk about the differences in scale. And then, so there's Mary Watson's essay. And then at the, first, at the other end of the scale, there's somebody like Madeleine Fullard, uh, who's both a historian and um, the head of the national, of the missing persons task team, uh, which for those who may not know was established on recommendation of the TRC. Uh, to trace the remains of uh, activists uh, whose bodies had never been found uh, who disappeared because of political violence between 1960 and 1994. And she takes us into the work um, that they do, which is in a sense, largely impersonal, but also very personal. And she's talking about deaths which are not her own, but she's the person that can give clues to families. She, uh, how do I say this, the right word? Uh, she's the person who's able to give closure to families and sometimes that closure never comes. And then I think I'll just hold, I'll hold on that. So just to say that, uh, so different forms, different scales, and this is what we wanted to do, just to have a conversation, um, a book that looks at this, uh, the question of death and dying from various points of view. And then the last thing I'll say is that, um, Kanyam Chali's essay, which is the penultimate essay in the book, looks at the question of afterlife, not necessarily from a religious point of view, but um, she talks about her friend would ask her to be, in the case of death, that she would manage her social media profiles. And what does this idea of afterlife mean when we have digital cells that in a way digital, uh, we all have digital iterations that will outlive us. And so just giving meditations on that, um, I feel like I've been a little all over the place, um, but I'm just going to pause here and then just ask Catherine, as always, to rescue me. <laughs> Not at all. Um, 
it's always such a joy and a privilege to be in conversation with you, Bongani. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you to our colleagues at Humor for allowing this to happen. Uh, my boss always said I should never start with a caveat, but I'm going to follow Bongani's lead and start with one, which is to say that if my internet drops, um, then also just bear with me if I've been having a, a shaky internet day. Um, but Bongani, thank you so much for, um, for starting us off and for really situating us in um, how this book came to be and and the form that it, the various forms um, the voices and forms that comprise this book and I really wanted to start uh, with, um, with some reflections because when I was preparing for our conversation today I was thinking about the extraordinary uh, backdrop against which this book has unfolded in that you know it was conceived as you were saying long before COVID although it's difficult to think of an exact point but certainly long before COVID the, the idea for the book came to be um, and then the contributions were largely written not about the pandemic but certainly during the pandemic um, in the midst of so much death and and now we're talking about what well, we're talking sometime after the book's publication uh, when the fear around COVID has largely waned, but there have been so many other waves of loss um, and grief to take its place both in South Africa and across the world. So I wonder if we can begin with some reflection, which is to ask how you have experienced this, this journey of the book from envisaging it to editing it, seeing it take shape and enter people's lives at such um, a poignant and prescient time um, and to this moment now of, of, of reflecting on it out in the world like what 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 has this journey of our ghost who wants people been like for you as as editor thank you so much for that question Catherine and I'll try and answer as honestly as possible um, I think it's difficult to use this word, but I'll have to use it. I think for me, the process was quite spiritual in a way because as you, you want, yeah, the pieces were, most of the pieces were written during the pandemic. And I just felt like, because, and for anyone, this is no secret, for anyone who's involved in South African publishing, the margins are not so high. You're not necessarily going to retire off a piece of writing, but there has to be a kind of willingness to say, uh, I'm going to do this with you. And so the conversations that uh, I had with each of the people during the process of putting the book together were like, I think it's, I've never had an experience like that working on a project. Just because in a way, I, I don't know who said this about poetry, that it's a language against which you have no defenses because it just, it just kind of everything is just, it, it hits straight to the heart. And I think those are the kinds of conversations we were having with people and even, and one of the things that never gets talked about, I guess, in forums like these are the pieces that don't make the book, but inevitably shape what the book is or what the book becomes. And I remember one contributor in particular, because I was at the laundry, I was at the laundry mat, and I remember just her on the other end of the phone, she's a very dear friend, but the experience was too difficult to write about. And she was apologizing. I said, Nick, you have no need to apologize. And and those things, like those kinds of experiences. And just, I think for me, that was like really, really, really more. And then in a way, because publishing works in, in very slow cycles, by the time that the book comes out, it's no longer, I feel like uh, it's no longer a work in progress. It belongs to somebody else. Um, the most exciting part for me is in a way in trying to shuffling the stories together, trying to work out the order of the stories, uh, speaking with people, getting the edits together, like that nitty gritty. And once the book comes in a way, it's, it's not somebody else. And even that, uh, I guess many people in the room will be able to recognize is like once you're, if you're working on a project, you're able to speak more articulately in the process of working uh, on it. The moment once it's done, uh, somehow the energy is not so much there, but um, I'm really grateful how people have received the book, how it's been received. But 
yeah, I guess that's my way of answering the question, Catherine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you almost wanted to sort of live its own life now that it's been kind of kind of birth to go on in its own way in the world. Um, I wonder if we can pick up on something that you mentioned earlier, and it's something I, I wanted to ask about. You spoke about silence as a form of protest in relation to that um, issue of Chimarenga that means a great deal to you. And I, yeah, I'd really love to touch on that a little bit more, this relationship between language and grief. And it's such a difficult thing to talk about because you know, the fact that words fail like so spectacularly in the face of a profound loss, it's, it's something of a cliche, but it's something that we, I think probably everyone has experienced very palpably, which has a way of kind of stripping that cliche. Um, and, but then also each of the contributions to the book approach the conundrum of language and the inadequacy of language so uniquely and so powerfully. Um, and I was thinking very much of Lidudu Malingani's essay alongside your own. Um, and I was wondering, yeah, there was that, there's that, that paragraph from Lidudu Malingani's essay that it would be wonderful if you could read it so just so we can kind of um, contextualize this, this chat and then we can maybe talk a bit more. Uh, thanks, uh, Catherine. Um, also, I just want to say I don't know everything, by the way, so I might throw back some of these questions to you, but here's the paragraph. Hey, hey. no, no, no. <laughs> That's not the deal. Yeah, I want just to say, yeah, here's the paragraph from uh, Ledudu Malingani's uh, essay, and it's, um, let me just read the paragraph. He writes, as a child, I was captivated by Emi Panga, uh, which is a radio show on Umtlobe Owenene, not because the names of the deceased were familiar or the concept of death was clear to me, but because of the alluring musicality and poetry of the show. Besides the long drawn piano chords and the pitch of the presenter's voice, there was something else that pulled you in. It had to do with the way the presenter began his sentences swapping synonyms with every announcement, using euphemism for every harsh word. The words were carefully chosen, selected by how sharp they are or how softly they landed on the ears of the listener. All those who have consoled the grieving know that truth and lies are of secondary importance to the words chosen. There's a science to it and the radio presenter understood it well. Uh, it's a beautiful piece and so just the thing about language, I think we'll have to think through it together. And I think maybe Ludu Dumalingani's piece offers like a really good jumping off point because also with Tato Monari's um, photo essay, if you think about it as well, because I think one of the limitations of this kind of project or one of the limitations of projects like this is that they're in language, they're in English for the most part. And that, uh, and one of the things that Dudu Malingani does in his essay is to, because sometimes I guess you get a, you don't get a sense from books that we read that there are other languages outside of English that exist in this place. And what does it mean to kind of cut off all of those knowledges or all of those ideas about uh, life and death in all of those other languages? And what Dudu Malingani does is that he brings in that kind of sensibility and also, particularly, just to give some context to people that are listening, Lidu Dumalingani's essay is situated in a very small village in the Eastern Cape. And he's talking about uh, his mother, who used to listen to this radio show, and just observing her as she listened to this radio show. And already there's like two things. I, I need to pause. So uh, we'll, need, <laughs> we'll need to help each other, Catherine, in the question of language. But just that's one thing I was thinking about that he brings other ways of uh, talking about death, other ways of talking about afterlife, other ways of talking about living um, that are outside English. And you know, you were speaking earlier about how the, the power of the collection being so much more than the sum of its parts and that uh, 
the essay speak to each other in this um, often unexpected way. Um, and I suppose that, that, of course, that experience is very unique for each reader. But for me, reading the Judah Malingani's reflection on the power of words, you know, so carefully chosen and that specificity in, um, in grief, which holds so much power, and reading that alongside your own essay in the book, The Descendants, where you recall your grandmother's deliberateness not to give words um, to a painful experience and that this wordlessness holds kind of as much power um, in, your, in your reading of it as the radio host's very careful scripting um, in Lududu Malingani's story. So yeah, that I think that for me, and um, yeah, you go. No, I was just going to jump in on the question of then silence and again on the language, just to come back to the contributor who said we had the conversation on the phone. And I was just thinking about, you will remember this, the Michael Longley, there's an Irish poet by the name of Michael Longley. And uh, he talks about how the raw material of experience needs to settle into an imaginative depth, if, into an imaginative depth before it can be turned into art. That somehow we can't, if that time hasn't come yet, it's difficult to write about something if it just hasn't settled into that. Yeah, and there's, the experience I was asking her to talk about had, had, it was too recent. So in a way like I can understand the silence that comes from that. And then I was talking about, I think there's a second quality of silence which you're trying to point to in, in the other essay. And I think a way to answer that is to speak via Habiba Badarun's poetry. One of like, and I, geez, I can't speak highly enough of, <laughs> of her poems, but like there's one poem in particular, and I'm not too sure if it's in A Hundred Silences or in Dream in the Next Body, How Not to Stop. And I'll just give a little bit of context. And you, it, the, point, the poem is written from the point of view of a schoolgirl, and she's talking about her father. You see she's describing her father. And the context for this is that uh, Habiba Badarun's parents were forcibly removed from Claremont, and she was born the year after in, I think in Athlone. And on the way to school or on the way when the father picks them up from school, he drives past this house and he doesn't look at it. And even though he made the front door, I think she writes something like, even though he made the front door with his own hands, that every day he drives past, he doesn't look at it, he doesn't speak it. And like, I find that really, really, really moving. And um, I guess it's, I don't want to use words like trauma or anything because I'm not an expert in, in, in those kinds of things. But definitely as a reader, I do know that sometimes, what is the word that I'm trying to say? That the people who have lived through the traumatic experience or who've lived through that traumatic experience, sometimes are not the ones who write about it. It's the children or the children after who write about that kind of experience. So that silence there is, um, I have no idea. You can come through, Catherine. No, I was thinking that silence has such a strong presence, whether or not it's given words in the moment that it um, charts its own life through, through the descendants. Um, sorry, you looked like you were about to. It's almost like negative space in, in a poem, like, the power comes from what is written down as much and from as much as that's what's not written down. Mm -hmm. mm. The music in between the notes, I think, is that, um, is that uh, composer who talks about the profile. It's not, it's not the notes, but the silences in between that kind of renders the beauty of a musical composition. Um, but I, 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 I'm just conscious of getting sidetracked so as will you step in if when it's time for uh, people to ask questions that we're not hugging it too much okay um i i know that if i press 
a press upon you, even with all my strength to name a favorite, <laughs> a favorite contribution in the collection, you'll tell me it's like um, choosing a favorite child. So I, I won't, I won't do that. But I, I am very curious about whether there's a particular story um, that in the collection that revealed something maybe new or unexpected for you about coming to terms with death or or the tools that can serve us in, in the long journey of, of processing death? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll kind of answer it in two ways, but obviously there are no favorites. <laughs> um, but I, I really just want to say this thing like uh, of like, just I've always loved that thing of creating a flat pan of just having the different stories together as the book is coming along, printing different versions. And, and sometimes, and we've spoken about this before, that when you know you're at the end of something, is it's like a body sensation. You feel like you're okay to just to let it go because it's in your body that, no, this thing is not yet finished. And I think something like that happened with, with, the, with, the, with the book itself, just kept waiting for a, a point where I think, oh, now it's, this is the piece that we had been waiting for. And that piece comes from Paula Akikuzibwe. And it's the last piece, like one of the final pieces because we've been waiting and we've created space to say, we'll give you 3000 words. But the topic she was writing about was so difficult. And for those who may not know, I'll just give some context. She writes about a student, a female student who was killed at the university she was at in 2012. And she was one of the, what do you call them? Like the whole monitors. And she really, and the person who was murdered was a very close friend of hers. And the piece is called How to Kill a Man. And like, I know it was so difficult. Like even now, I, it's a piece that I can't read without tearing up. But the moment she sent it through and it was 978 words. And I just, it was like, this is the thing that we've been just waiting for and thank you so much for writing this and it's just like um yeah so that that for me was like it was just it's difficult to describe but like that point that conversation with Paul and all of that was like was really meaningful but the project itself was always filled with meaningful conversations and yeah I was just I really marveled at her courage to push through to the end um and then in terms of uh, any kind of lessons, I, I don't know. I think one of the things when I think about Musa Wenkosi's poem, uh, poems in particular, which come from his collection, uh, All the Places, one of the, one of the poems in particular is called What the Township Did to Us. And what he kind of like points to there, which is something we already know, is that like we don't always have the same, we're not, our proximity to harm is not the same for all of us. Some people have like have a greater proximity to harm. And sorry to be jumping around the place just the other day, like a couple of a week ago, I remember speaking to uh, a security, um, a security guard, a woman, I think who's probably in her mid thirties or late forties, no mid thirties or early forties. And I'd asked her, it was a Monday, I said, how was your weekend? And she said, it was great you know, nothing bad happened, you know, like, I'm just kind of thinking, like, what kind of world do you have to come from to say that this is a good weekend, because nothing bad happened. And um, I don't know what exactly that I'm trying to get to there. That's to say that there are no lessons that are applicable to everyone or applicable to myself, or applicable to, yeah, to one person. I, I don't know if there are any lessons you get from it. Um, but to circle back, that was also the beginning of the project in any case was just to, this was one of the questions at the center of it, which is, um, yeah, how is it that other people are allowed to die and others are not, you know, I can, can retire in Hamanus and all of that. And how is that okay? Um, yeah, I think I'll pause there. Mm. Um, I, 
I wonder, this is on such a different note, but maybe it's in keeping with um, the kind of the varied voices as we, as you were talking about earlier and as we were talking about earlier that um, and the varied sort of registers um, of the collection, but uh, the relationship between um, humor and grief is such an interesting one to me. Um, and the necessity of humor perhaps to survive grief um, or at least the kind of uh, lightness that needs to be left back into our lives in, in some shape or form following an experience of loss um, yeah just to enable us to sort of go on being in the world and I was thinking of Karen because um, which is just such an incredibly powerful and devastating essay but there's some parts in it which are um, unbelievably funny sort of amidst it all or despite it all or because of it all um, yeah and I'd love to know if there were any stories that surprised you kind of in their ability to make you chuckle or laugh out loud um, in between the profundity of, of the sadness Wait, I think you're on, you're on mute. We're missing your gems. You see, humor already is coming through. So. <laughs> yes, it's bound to happen. I'm glad it was you and not me. <laughs> yeah, I am mute. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, Karen Shimka's piece definitely is one of those. But just on the point of humor, you know, like I grew up with, like many people, with the American sitcom, and I can't stand that genre. Like I because it's trying to be funny by not speaking of the real things. Like I just, it can never deal with the real things in the frame as them. I, I could be wrong, I, sorry, this is my two minute rant a day about American sitcom. But the kind of humor that I like is the one that's able to take everything, which is what Karen Sinfer does in a piece. It's funny because she's also speaking about something real. She's not afraid to go there. Uh, if that makes sense, that sounds very kind of esoteric. Um, and like that's the kind of writing that I just kind of love that's able to take in both the drama, the sadness and the humor, like to hold it all in one frame is extremely difficult to do. And that she's able to do that for me, is like really amazing. And you laugh from a very different place. And there's that kind of laughter where we're avoiding about, we're repressing everything. We're going to avoid all the difficult topics, which is so disingenuous. Mm -hmm. So did you have the experience of when you were editing, like coming across some, um, I guess that that example that we've drawn on or some other pieces where you were kind of, yeah, I don't know, just sort of taken aback or surprised in this moment of maybe the poignancy of humour like in a, in, a, in a collection about grief? Uh, yeah, so three examples I'll give just off the top of my head. So there's the Karen Shemka, she has a dream about uh, her abusive father. It, it sounds really bad to say this, but she has a dream about, or the abusive father appears in a dream to her ex-husband. And just the way that the dream is described, I think is like absolutely hilarious. And then the second piece is by, um, by Anna Hartford, which is a philosophical piece which tries to look at um, the ethics of killing so-called small animals like birds and bugs and rats and, and that kind of thing. I think that piece is, as much as it offers us wisdom, is also really funny. And then a last example I give is Simone Hayson's piece, uh, because that humor is maybe slightly inappropriate, but I really like it uh, because of its inappropriateness. And she's writing about heroin addiction and the state's response to it, which is, and society's response to it. But there's a part when there's a grandmother who says, uh, Hulvat Alice, have I pronounced it correctly? Hulvat Alice, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I thought that line still cracks me up all the time. Yeah. yeah. Um. I, I suppose I think this is on a related note, but I was also really curious to think through, well, think about how the, 
the various chapters that get prompt us to think about how we put ourselves together, back together after grief and always in a different shape and always with um, scars um, to, as testament to what we've been through, but put back together nevertheless in some in, in a meaningful way. And um, we've spoken before about Malika and Lovu's chapter, which is, a really powerful example of this, of the kind of leaning into the realness of death in order to be able to go on living. So maybe it's that or same, uh, a different sort of example of the same thing that you're talking about of this, this frame, um, allowing, uh, you know, the frame of humor, not just being about something very curated, but allowing everything in. And I get that same kind of expansive feeling from her essay where there's this just incredible generosity of spirit and that there's an allowance for um, great and profound grief and also lightness, um, possibility, uh, a life beyond um, the one that was lost. And then I was also thinking of Sison Kem Simang, you know, the purpose that motherhood gives her um, like the necessity of her own survival in the wake of her mother's death. Um, so yeah, just, uh, I know there's not a specific question there, but I would love to hear your thoughts on, um, on what you took or maybe a, a particular contribution that was particularly profound for you of how we see ourselves, who we are in the face of death and in the wake of it. Uh, I think, yeah, thank you so much again, Catherine. I think the Malika's piece, and for those who haven't read the essay, uh, Malika Ndlovu uh, is, uh, the reason I approached her was because like maybe 20 years ago, she wrote a, uh, a poetry journal called, not a poetry journal, it's like a poetic diary called Journal of Stillbirth, uh, Invisible Earthquake Journal of a Stillbirth. And she's talking about uh, her journey through stillbirth. And I think um, she felt the baby's last heartbeat on the 27th of December, but only went to the midwife, I think on the 1st of January, she waited three days as a period of three days. And this is, a, this is an experience that was at the time, I guess, yeah, as expectedly very devastating for her. Um, but the way that even, so the original plan actually was to uh, was to take excerpts from the uh, from the poetic journal because I found it ex exquisitely beautiful. And also she's writing about experience from inside that for me personally, like I just hadn't encountered in that way. But then what happened is um, when I was doing the research for the book, reading all sorts of things, there was a thing called a death and birth conference uh, in Constantia. This is before the pandemic. And where I think it was mixed with uh, birth doulas and then people who see, uh, who work in palliative care or different kinds. And I saw Malika there. So I went to this conference and it was just, for me, like it was an access to language that I don't normally get, you know, um, because I'm so kind of in, um, I, want, I want to say maybe humanities based my whole entire life in newspapers. And so there's a particular language that I'm kind of used to, but this was a very different language of talking about the body, about talking about the end of life and all of these things. And what moved me in particular about Malika is how she's committed to working with other women and families who've gone through similar processes and, and how she's, and also, you will know this from the essay that she doesn't subscribe to the idea of you should move on from this experience. It's now been X amount of years. She doesn't really subscribe to that idea. And she's invested in kind of including um, the lost child in her family narrative and how she works with other women. I find that like really extraordinary. So I think that comes out that kind of relentless, not relentless, I was going to say relentless positivity. But that idea that definitely can come out of these experiences comes out in an essay because that's how pretty much she lives a life. And again, one of those essays that still like moves in quite deep, even reading it now. Yeah, absolutely. I think we only have about 15 minutes left. So probably it's time to allow. Yes. 
oh, yeah. the friends around us. The, the, the discussion was really amazing. Like we could listen to you forever. <laughs> um, yeah, forever and ever. Yeah, but not in the death sense, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah so yeah um i will open now the discussion for the uh, for the floor if you have any question or any remark you can actually raise your oh i see amina already raising her hand <laughs> uh so it's either you raise your virtual hand or you write um in the chat and i will read it okay amina go ahead Thank you so much, Azza. Thank you, Bongani, and, and thank you, Catherine. This was really wonderful. It was really wonderful listening to you. And uh, but Bongani, I first came across your work uh, through Jess Arbach, who says hi. Uh, she had sent me your short story and uh, at your requiem like five years ago, I think. And um, yeah, it's it's really wonderful to to hear you today. And um, so for me, I just I just had a yeah, I guess I haven't read the book yet. Only Sison uh, Kim Simang's essay that you shared, and um, from the conversation uh, that you, that you had uh, with Catherine, I I think that it's really wonderful that this book brings sort of different dimensions of grief and allowing us to recognize that um, experiencing grief comes in multiple ways, uh, and it's not. You don't experience grief in in one singular sort of articulations of emotions um and how interestingly enough we're never prepared to deal with death um and we're never prepared to maneuver uh grief when it becomes a materiality like when you have to handle a coffin when you have to walk in a symmetry or in a space where your loved ones uh, are no longer, or when you're grieving different different things. And I was thinking about how silence can live on for generations. So you, you sort of inherit silence um, and, and the ghost becomes an embodiment of that silence. And I guess I was just thinking about the title, Our Ghosts Were Once People. And I wanted to ask you like, why the specific title? Because you could, I mean, I <laughs> in my in my in my mind, I was trying to reframe the sentence. Uh, I guess the title can be flipped around eventually, and we could say that our people will be ghosts. So we're preparing ourselves for that for that grief that is yet to come. Um, so I wanted to ask you about the title, why our ghosts were once people, like this specific part, and why do we need to humanize the ghosts? Why do we need to uh, remind people or remind ourselves that they were once um, like us as we go about living in the physical world? Uh, thank you so much, Amina. Um, so yeah, just uh, before I get to the title, I just want to say that uh, one of the pieces that I really like also, like I like all of the pieces, there's a piece by Khadija Patel and where she's, she talks about uh, shortly after high school, she's a Muslim woman and shortly after high school, her and her sister volunteered at the center in Fordsburg in Johannesburg uh, to wash the bodies of the deceased before burial. And she takes us into this really intimate space because I think they volunteered because they were worried because the two dummies that she calls them, everyone was scared that they would die off and there'd be nobody to take to do this really sacred role. And so she takes us into this really beautiful, intimate space. And it's also a piece that's filled with humor and so much love for community. And so I just wanted to speak on that because um, I guess I got triggered by your mention of the materiality and coffins. And then the title itself is so the beginning of the project was called The End of the Story because it was meant to be about writers writing about um, the end of life or the end uh, that was meant to be the play of the writers writing on death or the end of the story. Um, but as it happens, thankfully, the publishers didn't like that. 
Um, but in the process of reading and researching, one book that became really important uh, was Jasmine Ward's book, Men We Reaped. Uh, she's an American writer, a novelist, but this is her memoir, Men We Reaped. And it is about the death of five young black men who are close to her, one of those being her brother. So each chapter is dedicated to one of her friends and the last chapter is dedicated to her brother. And in that book, she says that, you know, to say that writing this is difficult would be understatement, but my ghosts were once people. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I think I forget what the line was, but yeah, to say that this is difficult would be understatement, but my ghosts were once people and I cannot forget that. And so that's where the title kind of comes from, from that line. Um, and yeah, so I hope that I've answered your, answered your question. It did, thank you. Yeah. yeah um, yes, actually, thank you very much. Um, I don't see anyone, so I will take the opportunity to to ask my question and or, yeah, just to think. Uh, I, mean, I also didn't read the book, and I really, really love to read it. Um, I mean, I think the experience of grief is is our collective experience you know like everyone here uh, sitting here of course experience grief in a different way um yeah so what i wanted to to ask is i mean we we talk about yeah the the the, the uniqueness of grief but there are also like um there are also ways that we all relate you know, in one way or another, when we talk about grief, there is there is grief that's collective. We do all together. You know, there is a grief that's subjective. There's a grief that's individual. You know, like there's different ways of um, um, well practicing uh, practicing grief or experiencing grief. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's also there's different ways of how we transcend you know like i mean one way is to think of us as ghosts one way is to think of us as trees i don't know one way is to think of us as animals um there's different ways how we transcend and how we locate that de death you know and how we um commemorate commemorate like our uh, the lives of our beloved ones or yeah or even in the the ones we just even we didn't even experience, of course, their deaths, and probably we, they are not as such the beloved ones, but they definitely represent something into our lives. I mean, if you talk about the activists, you know, the activists died. I mean, it's it's about probably the um, the death of hope. You know, activists are always working at in uh, towards a particular hope. You know, I'm just having in my mind. Uh, the people who are shot now in Sudan, like the, the youth who are getting shot because of, um, you know, because of the revolution and they're trying to um, bring change, you know, and of course we are not related to them, you know, directly, but we are related to the cause, you know, so we, we grieve, you know, and collectively grieve when, when, when things uh, like this occur and happen, you know. So I would like to know if just, sorry, I'm, I'm just blabbering, but I'd like to know if these things are reflected in a way in the book and also, yeah, just to discuss about these collective experiences of grieving and how we transcend differently. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And um, I don't know if I'll be able to do justice to your question, though, to be honest, but I was going to say that I think the book itself in the many different voices in a way kind of gives um, uh, is an example of the kind of collective uh, ways of seeing death, experience, and grief. But also, like, I, I always think that although the project has a final cover, I don't think it's, it's in a way, uh, how do I say this? Ooh. The project itself could have gone on and on and on, and I think it, it deserves to. The idea is that you know, I need to take a step back and I'm gonna to have to try and say this as, because I see uh, time is running out. Like, I just wanna try and say it as well as I can. I remember like um, many years ago, like when I used to work in advertising, I'm coming around to the thing, I promise. And 
there's this particular magazine that I loved. It was like a music magazine. And there used to be a fun Skype on the corner of Strand and Long Street, I think. Uh, but there's now a KFC there or McDonald's, but there used to be a fun Skype and they'd have two issues. And the woman would know that I'm coming, it's the end of the month. And I'd be like, is it here? Is it here? Uh, before the magazine was discontinued. And I just, I love the feeling of reading about all of this music stuff. And I just like, I love that sensation of, of reading stuff that related to me. And like, I've always had that feeling with magazines, even with journals. Like I was trying to play it cool earlier, but I, like, I totally love that stuff. Like I get so excited, even when I'm reading a issue of Freeman's on Arrival or an issue on, on Home. And just like, I'm like amazed that this stuff is happening. And the thing about it is that like, I feel so much, I feel so much love that I want to go and write. I want to go and do this thing again. And the thing is, I say all of this to say that it's the same with our goals so once people. The idea is not so much that this is now a full stop. The idea is that you also feel you get, because it's like making a mixtape for somebody that you love and then you just send it out into the world and you get the, you feel that you listen to this, that it might give you some, it might give you what you need for this particular moment. But the idea is that you go forward and you also do something else that you feel like I'm going to give this other thing. I don't know if that makes sense, but it was just like in that sense that uh, out of love, we're just going to put this out into the world and in the hope that it helps somebody for a time, not forever. And then in the way you might find your own way forward. So, um, sure. Yeah, I may have gone, I was blubbering and sorry, Aza. No, not at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there another question? Or oh, Catherine, would you like to probably also respond to my remark and to Amina's remarks? I was just thinking it. It, it made your remark made me think about. Um, that Ursula Le Guin line in Sisonke's essay, where she um, uh, she talks about the company, or oh, I might not have the mark here exactly. Um, anyway, she well, she talks about grief being a burden, quoting Le Guin saying, "Grief is a burden um, that you bear alone, and that there's no company in grief." But actually, after quoting that line, Sonkin Simang's chapter kind of undercuts that sentiment in a way, or, uh, and, and as I think the whole book could be seen as working against or maybe offering some kind of solace in the face of the solitude um, of grief. And yeah, that's what I think came to my mind when you spoke about the collectiveness of grief, because we can all experience it as an incredibly fragmenting and sort of, um, yes, as Ursula Le Guin says, something that you experience alone. And yet there is, I think, a commonality to be found. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Um, we have Alison. Um, so Alison wrote her question in the chat. Um, she's saying, thank you for your reflections on the relationship between humor and grief. My question is on how you dealt with the gap between intention and impact in dealing with humor. Something that the, the reader might find humorous that the author didn't necessarily intend to be humorous. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. need your help, Catherine. Like, you. like I think what what she's saying that um, sometimes probably what we think it's humor probably that was not necessarily the author's intention to be humorous, but it's humor for us, so it's hilarious for us with our own. Understand. I don't know if Alison, do you want to probably clarify your question a bit? Or you sure. not possible. Uh, sorry, okay, sorry, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. let me sure. Um, thank you so much for for your your reflections and just kind of hearing your conversation with each other was so lovely. Um uh, I guess my, my question was was really on um on how humor is both 
an important coping mechanism, but it's also so dependent on interpretation and it's so context dependent. And so I was curious if, um, if you know, in, in working, I guess you work directly with the authors, so it might be a bit different. You can actually ask them, <laughs> did you intend for this to be humorous? But I guess my, my question is as a reader, you know, how do we kind of bridge that gap between um, between intention and impact, like something that might resonate with with me as a reader that I find humorous in a way that's not um, disrespectful or inauthentic to to the way that the author was meant for it to be read. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. I'll come in quickly and then maybe Catherine, if you wouldn't mind just jumping in as well. Um, I was going to say that because there's also a lot of humor in your piece, by the way, and I was going to say that uh, in some of the pieces, because we went through several drafts with some of the pieces, the ones that went uh, hadn't been published elsewhere. And the thing is, the challenge there is not so much is this funny, but it's trusting that uh, other readers will still find this funny, even though we've listened to the, in a way, quote unquote, listened to the joke over four or five drafts. So just trusting that this is still fine, that I can still laugh at this. And maybe that's really the true test, if you can still look at something and still even now think, wow, that's really funny. So I hope that answers your question. So, yes, Catherine? No, I don't think I have anything, uh, yeah, to add to that, um, to what Bongani said, besides, I think, that that relationship it's it's all uh, between the reader um and the text is always it's not just you know obviously applicable to humor but that's always such an interesting terrain to be traversing like how once you put something out into the world how does it get received and often it can be at odds with your intention um and um and sometimes that's a beautiful thing and sometimes a very difficult thing so that's just my very small addition. Okay, so I think we are one minute past five. I mean, if there is any question or any remark, otherwise we will end here and not end, but continue the discussion in a, in a different format. You know, you can send an email, you can, you know, just send a, a message and say, hey, we want to meet for coffee. There's different ways to <laughs> continue the discussion. So yeah, so if there's no other questions, then I'll thank, thank you so much, Bongani and Catherine. That was a wonderful discussion. And I personally learned a lot. Um, yeah, and I'm looking forward to read the book actually. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. So, yeah.